All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our July 19th webinar on how the new cannabis rules are going to be impacting tenant landlord law here in Minnesota. Uh, we had a lot of people registered, uh, so I'm going to give it just a couple of, well, 30 seconds, maybe a minute to let folks come in uh, and get themselves situated in before we get going. But we will have a lot of ground to cover today. So I will uh, want to get us started here pretty quick. This is being recorded um, and we will be applying for CLE credits. We haven't been approved yet, so um, we will let you all know what that code is for those of you who are in need of CLE credits from this. Thank you. All right. All right, I think I'm seeing that things are starting to slow down here, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, again, uh, welcome to everybody who is joining us today. We have some uh, attorneys here from Homeline who are going to be covering the new cannabis rules and how, well, specifically how they impact tenant landlord law. They're not going to be going over the whole thing because there's a lot to it. We're going to be focusing specifically on how it impacts tenant landlord situations. Um, so uh, without further, uh, I've got a couple of housekeeping things uh, just to get things going, and then I will turn it over to Andrea and Larry. So what is Homeline? If this is your first time joining us, uh, Homeline is a statewide nonprofit organization. We provide free legal, educational, and advocacy services for renters here in Minnesota. Uh, we recently passed our 300,000 uh, household, uh, household assisted mark. Uh, in the 31 years that we've been around. Uh, our, like I said, our program is free. It's usually done through a hotline, which folks can call us. Uh, we do service in four languages, English, Somali, and Hmong, and we also have an email option. Uh, that's our phone number here and our various numbers for the different language lines that we have and how to access our email and attorney option, if that's preference. Um, again, all this is available at our website, homelinemn.org, so you can go there as well. Um, so our housekeeping the session is being recorded and is going to be available on Homeline's website in a few days um, once we get it all uploaded to our cloud. Um, we had a lot of pre-submitted questions, um, but we also, if you have questions that come up or um, you don't think that your pre-submitted question was um, clear enough, uh, feel free to put that in the Q&A option in the um, bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A link that you can use. Please use that. Don't try to use the chat. The chat gets lost and I am going to be posting a bunch of links and things there. Um, so things just get super lost in the shuffle. Uh, so please use the Q&A function. Um, please, please, please. <laughs> Um, and again, this will be, uh, we'll be applying for 1.5 standard CLE credits. Here's a list of our upcoming webinars. So obviously this one, we're having these once a month through, well, the beginning of next year, uh, covering all of the different updates to the uh, laws that impact tenant landlord law that were passed during this last legislative session. So there was quite a bit that went on. And so we're going to be kind of, um, addressing different aspects of those new laws in uh, our monthly webinars for the rest of the year. So this is the list. You can get more information and register through our website, uh, homelinemn.org uh, forward slash new laws. All right. And then also, uh, for those of you who are interested in CLE credits, 
we are going to be having a big full day CLE on all of these changes as well coming up on December 7th uh, that we will be hosting for all of the changes that are going to be taking place come January 1st of 2024. More information will come, but just wanted you to mark your calendars now uh, in anticipation for that. Ah, finally, I'm done with my bit. So I am going to turn it over to housing attorney Andrea Palumbo, uh, who will then turn it over to our policy attorney, Larry McDonough. Uh, thank you both for diving into this really complicated set of rules and figuring out how this um, changes the work that we do our, and the people that we serve. So thank you. And I'm going to I'm going to step away now. Andrea, you are on mute. <laughs> All right, we'll start again. Uh, thank you, like Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and thank you, Matt. He's in that office over there. Um, um, we are going to be looking at Session Law 63, House File 100. Um, this has not been codified yet. So if you want to look it up on the state registers off um, webpage, you will need to be looking for Minnesota Session Law Chapter 63. And this is landmark legislation. It's been talked about for years. And this was the session that we finally moved to getting legalized cannabis uh, um, to be a, a thing, basically. It the the bills went through, I think, 27 House and Senate committees combined. It this is a huge piece of legislation and it touches multiple areas of law. And we are going to be fo focusing primarily on the sections that affect landlord tenant matters. But if you wanna, it covers, the, it covers licensing to sell, um, changing criminal law, really broad range of, of, of areas. You can check out um, just how broad it is by, by going to the, the revisers page. Okay, hey, next slide. All right, kind of starting with the definitions. Again, the, the definition section of the statute is pretty long, but uh, what we're really looking at today are the types of cannabis and that are basically legal now. So we're going to be talking about cannabis flower, which is the harvested flower, bud, leaves, and stems of a cannabis plant cannabis concentrate, which is resins, and edible cannabis product. Um, last session, we did the, I should say the legislature legalized some forms of hemp products. Um, this is different. This is cannabis product. It's not the hemp derived product that was legalized last session. Uh, some more definitions. Next slide. So we've been talking about the, the product itself, the, the cannabis, the leaves, the stems, and uh, paraphernalia um, is also defined. So it's all equipment and products and materials used in ingesting or inhaling the smoke from cannabis or vaping cartridges or otherwise introducing cannabis flower or products into the body. The last piece, the equipment used in manufacturing and testing strength and purity, that's more concerned with licensing for sale and selling it, not as much for personal use. Now, next definition I wanna to touch on is medical cannabinoid product. Um, we are gonna be talking somewhat about the Minnesota Department of Health medical registry. There is a medical marijuana registry that's been in um, operation. And that program specifically does not include synthetic THC products. Um, it does not include adult use cannabis products. And what we mean by that, it is um, it is limited to cannabis, flower products, paraphernalia that are only used for approved patients in the licensing program. Um, the registry um, 
is very specific. Um, in order for a patient to enroll, they have to have one of a list of qualifying medical conditions, and those are also listed in the statute. And most commonly, AIDS, chronic or intractable pain, Alzheimer's, cancer treatment, glaucoma, things like that. So a patient has to be approved to be using medical marijuana. They have to be approved by the state. And there's multiple effective dates all throughout the statute, as you'll see as we discuss this. But for the definition section, most of them, the majority of them, have already taken effect as of July 1st. So now we're going to get into possession and use. Um, the statute considers an adult to be someone 21 or older. And an adult who's 21 or older legally can use, possess, or transport cannabis paraphernalia. They can transport two ounces or less of adult use cannabis in a public place and up to two pounds, they can possess up to two pounds of adult use cannabis flower in their own home. Now to give you kind of a, a yardstick on this, two ounces of dried cannabis is about the size of an egg, maybe a little smaller and two pounds one pound of dry marijuana is about the size of a small round watermelon. So two pounds is a lot, um, but that kind of gives you an, an eye and something to, to use as a reference for what we're talking about. Uh, an adult who's 21 or older may also transport up to eight grams of adult use cannabis concentrate and edible cannabis products or lower potency hemp edibles, those were the ones that uh, were legalized last session with up to 80 milligrams of THC. The, the lower potency edibles, when they were legalized, they were up to five milligrams of THC. So that's quite a jump in the potency that's permitted. So that's possession and use. When it comes to use, an adult 21 years or older can use adult use cannabis flower and products on private property, which includes the curtilage, the yard, so long as the area is not, gen not generally accessible to the public, except an, an individual may be expressly prohibited from consuming flour and cannabis products on the property by the owner of the property. So this is where tenants, ten, landlord tenant relations are gonna come into, come into play. A person can definitely use it in their own house and on their yard, so long as it's not generally accessible to the public. But if someone is living in someone else's house, then that is a situation where they can be expressly prohibited. Now, with home cultivation, it's possible now for a person who's 21 years or age or older to grow up to eight plants and no more than four of those can be mature at a given time without a license to grow. Anything more than eight plants or four mature plants, the person is going to need a license to cultivate. This has to be in the primary residence of the individual and it has to be in an enclosed lock space that's not open to the public. And again, the primary residence includes the curtilage and the yard but it can't, be access, it can't be accessible to the public or readily accessible to the public. And when we're talking about uh, mature plants, we're talking about plants that have uh, flowered and have visible buds on them. Now, when it comes to personal adult use and, and home cultivation, there are penalties for having more than eight plants, more than four flowering. Um, there's civil penalties and there's also possible criminal penalties there. Now, this is a, a piece we're going to come back to again. Um, if someone is in a registry program, a landlord cannot refuse to lease to that patient solely because they're enrolled in the registry, registry program and legally are using canna medical cannabis 
unless failing to do that would violate federal law or regulations or would cause the landlord to lose a monetary or licensing related benefit under federal law. So this is really key. And this section is effective March 1st, 2025. So basically a landlord cannot refuse to rent solely because someone's on the in the registry program unless federal law and regulations are coming into play there. And we will revisit that. <laughs> uh, next slide. The same is true for a school. Um, they cannot penalize someone solely because they're enrolled in the registry program or um, if they are in a um, tribal medic medical cannabis program. And again, unless failing to do so, would violate federal regulations or cause the school or landlord to lose a monetary or licensing benefit. Yeah, Andrea, if I can jump in for a second. Sure. Um, you might notice that there's similar language between this slide and the slide we just looked at. And this, so the slide we just looked at has similar language with an effective date down the road. And then the <laughs> second slide here has similar language, not identical, but similar, effective the day following enactment. And so what's the explanation on that? I think the explanation and, and something we'll be discussing today is that there are inconsistencies in this. This is a very big bill, and a lot of people were working on different sections of it. And I think there was some disconnection with some of this. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll highlight some of the disconnections, but this is one of them. And so when I read these two things together, you know, what a landlord would need to be following is the one that's right in front of you right now, because that's the one that's effective right now. The previous slides, very similar, but not effective um, for you know, whatever, a year and a half or something. That's a great point. That's an excellent point. The actual text of the bill is about an inch thick. So um, there are there are inconsistencies and, it, and inconsistencies within itself and also with it uh, within other statutes statutes outside of this. Um, and, and finally, last part of my section is sober homes. Um, sober housing for people with substance abuse orders may prohibit people in the program from the possession and use of cannabis flower products, lower potency hemp edibles, or hemp derives consumer products. So this is this is an area where they can um, they can prohibit in the people in the program from the possession of use of cannabis. And there's no date listed on this for the effective date, so it's effective August 1st. So I'm going to turn things back over to Larry now. Uh, thanks, Andrea. So I'm going to continue on. And uh, first is uh, we're kind of taking these somewhat in order of where they appear in this really large bill. So nuisance law. Um, why do we care about that? I'm talking about landlord tenant because there are some provisions here that get at when people can sue others over use of cannabis. And um, as you can see from the first paragraph here, uh, it, this appears to be pretty open-ended. Adult use of cannabis flower, which is injurious to health, indecent or offensive to the senses, which sounds like a pretty low bar, or an obstruction to the free use of property so as to interfere with the comfortable enjoyment of life or property is a nuisance. Okay? Um, now, I'm a word nerd, so one of the first things I do when I look at this is that very last clause uh, talking about interfering with comfortable enjoyment of life or property is a nuisance. Does that modify everything in front of it, or does it just modify an obstruction to the free use of property? I don't know. Probably just the latter, but that, that might be open to interpretation. So um, it appears that these are pretty subjective standards. Um, you know, use of a, you know, if someone's, uh, you know, smoking marijuana, uh, could that be injurious to someone's health nearby, potentially? Um, could it be indecent or offensive to the senses? Possibly. Um, obstruction of the free use of property. 
I don't know if that gets at if your neighbor's smoking marijuana in the backyard and it's so offensive that it keeps you from using the backyard. Um, is that going to be a nuisance or not? So the bar is pretty low here. But the reason why I think there's not going to be a lot of action under this is that the remedies are pretty modest. And a person who is injuriously affected or personal enjoyment is lessened, again, that latter one seems like a pretty low bar, um, may bring an action for injunctive relief and the greater of the person's actual damages or civil penalty of 250 bucks. So civil penalty doesn't go to the plaintiff, that goes to the government. Actual damages, I think, are going to be hard to prove. Um, and so, and, you know, injunctive relief certainly is something that perhaps a plaintiff could obtain by doing this. Um, let's move on to the next slide, and then I'll, I'll, then I'll also tell you why I really doubt there's going to be a lot of action with this. Now, this one's a little more um, connected to landlord-tenant, because it says if a landlord uh, or an association uh, fails to enforce terms of a lease, governing document, or policy related to adult use cannabis flower on the premises of property, a person who is injuriously affected or his personal enjoyment is lessened by a nuisance under the subdivision one, as a, so that was the previous slide, as a result of failure to enforce the terms, may bring an action against the landlord association seeking injunctive relief and the greater of the person's actual damages or civil penalty of 500. So we have the, the difference here is that we have the first one um, provision focused on the person using the cannabis flower. This one focuses on a landlord not enforcing a lease provision related to, for instance, saying, you know, don't smoke any marijuana on the property. Okay, so landlord could be sued for that. Um, again, the remedy is pretty small. I mean, the plaintiff could get for, you know, potentially injunctive relief, and that would be landlord, you know, enforce your lease. Um, you know, actual damages or civil penalty. If there are no actual damages, it's going to just be a civil penalty of five hundred dollars going to the going to the government. So, you know, I I th there's some really low bars here, but I think because the remedies are are so minimal that there's not going to be a lot to come out of this. Um, but you know, we'll have to see. I mean, when you look at this whole law, it's really the impact of it is to allow um, certain types of cannabis uses, and there are some limitations on it. Um, I, I'd really be surprised if the judiciary is going to use these types of nuisance laws to sharply curtail use that is otherwise legal uh, under this bill. But we'll, we'll have to see. So let's move on. Expungement. Um, so there are a number of, um, there are a few provisions in this law that modify existing landlord-tenant laws. And one of them is modifying um, our law on expungement. For those of you that think that the only landlord-tenant laws are in Chapter 504B, this is an example of one that, that sits somewhere else. Um, and so this says, if the tenant brings a motion for expungement, of an eviction, the court shall, not may, but shall order expungement of the eviction case that was commenced on the grounds of a violation of 504B-171. We'll talk about that in a moment, but that's the law that um, says that both landlords and tenants agree to not allow um, uh, illegal drug use on the property and some other things as well, but the, the statute's mostly been used in the area of drugs, okay? So to back up, court shall expunge eviction case based on that statute or any other claim of breach um, if the tenant could receive an automatic expungement under 609A055, which is a law related to criminal expungements, or if the breach was based solely on the possession of marijuana or, and I have a hard time saying the next word, so I'll just say the next word. Okay, so what this is getting at is that if if there was if there were cases that was based only on a marijuana violation of 504B171, 
that that case, the court shall expunge it if the tenant brings a motion on it. Um, I've been doing this a long time, uh, almost 40 years representing landlords and tenants. I probably have 10,000 clients behind me at this point. I'm, I can think of a handful of cases that were only based on marijuana and 504B171. Um, and that's in my experience. So I think this is a little bit of a drop in the bucket. Um, now, I think what's more important in the area of expungement is what we're going to discuss in a future uh, presentation, because there were other changes to the statute in a different law, session law 52, um, Senate file 2909. That's the one, that's the big one that has lots of changes in landlord tenant law in it in article 19. And there are several changes to expungement law there. Those don't go into effect until January 1. This one change here on the top part of the slide goes into effect next month. Okay, so now let's move on to 504B171. Um, so it's a pretty big change here, and it's not on this slide. It'll be on the next one, but I'm going to take this one first. So this is the, the law that has been most connected to marijuana use because it, it said that if a tenant, tenant or landlord unlawfully allowed controlled substances on the premises, um, then that would be a violation of this covenant. Um, tenants could sue landlords over that. We haven't seen a lot of that. Uh, landlords have filed eviction cases of ten against tenants, and we've seen a bit of that. Okay, so the big change here is um, the word unlawfully is taken out. And so now it says neither will allow controlled substances on the premises and common area, the curtilage in violation of any criminal provision of chapter 152. And chapter 152 is, for instance, the chapter that used to make the distinctions between a possession of a small amount of marijuana as being a petty misdemeanor and other um, other um, kind of weights of, of uh, marijuana or cannabis being um, different, different having different kind of um, spaces in the criminal justice system. Now, one of the things that, uh, and just doing a little la last minute kind of thinking about this presentation, that I should have added in this, so this is not a slide on it, but this is the right time to talk about it, is there is part of the bill that, that basic, well, I'll just tell you what it is. So it's section 58, um, it, um, it creates a new law, 342.57. After we're done today, I will add a slide on this. And a subdivision two there says that several things are not violations of this new law 342, but also not violations of chapter 152. And it has a list of several types of things. I'll just read them off real quickly. You don't have to take notes on this because I'll add this to the slide deck. But use of possession of medical, medical cannabis flower, da, 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 da. Uh, possession of medical cannabis flower, possession of, and so several things related to medical cannabis have been removed from 152. Also, there have been several part of what this bill, this law did, is repealed some of the laws in 152 related to marijuana. And so I'm going to add both of these uh, to the slides when we're done. Um, and, and the reason I've started thinking about that is it occurred to me when I was kind of look, taking a last look at the slides that a lot of what um, this new law did is create a new chapter, but there are some references into the old chapter that is cross-referenced here. So what this all means is that um, what used to be a violation of 504B171 uh, with possession of various quantities of cannabis and marijuana are no longer a violation of 504B171. But the next part of 504B171 is perhaps even a more radical change in this, or I, would, I guess I don't want to say radical, but a, a, a substantial change here, is that 
up till now, what 504B171 was saying is landlords and tenants won't allow certain things to happen on the property. And the, 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 the act that was most litigated were um, uh, illegal drugs on the property, mostly by tenants. It could have been litigated against landlords, but we haven't seen a lot of those cases. The big change here is now we have a section, a new subsection in 504B171 that is different. It, it now says what a landlord can't prohibit a tenant from doing. The other parts of this talk about what a landlord and tenant should not allow on the property. And this is now saying what a landlord cannot prohibit a tenant from doing. And so from legally possessing, um, and a tenant cannot waive the right to legally possess, any cannabis products, um, we've got a list here, other than the consumption by combustion or vaporization of the product and inhalation of smoke, aerosol, or vapor from the product. So essentially what this is saying is that the landlord cannot prohibit the other legal uses of cannabis with the exception of essentially the smoking and vaping types of uses, okay? And there was no date listed on this. And so this is effective August 1, 2023. Um, now, you might, you might be thinking, or you should be thinking anyway, okay, well, wait a minute. Didn't Andrea say a few slides back that an adult can use cannabis, flower, and products on private property, not generally accessible to the public, unless the individual is expressly prohibited from consuming that by the owner of the property, okay? So how do we reconcile these? Well, you know, there is a canon of construction and looking at laws that the more specific basically trumps the more general. When I look at these two, I see landlord is a narrower category of property owner than owner of the property. So I think that these both coexist with the slide um, that you're looking at right now being the one that's operative for landlords and that the other one that we discussed a little bit earlier would have more to do with a non-landlord homeowner. So I'm a homeowner. I could say that some adult who comes here, uh, I can say expressly, you're prohibited from using these things on my residential property. And, um, and if they didn't, they would be in violation of the law. Um, so that's how I read these two together. Um, it could be there'll be some litigation at some point where someone um, litigates the difference between the two of these, but I think that's the way to reconcile the two. Now, the other thing about 171 is there are other changes to 171 in session law 52. That's the other one that covers a lot of landlord tenant law. Most of the provisions in that law are effective January 1, but this one, the, the other changes to 171, other than the one that's in front of you right now, don't go to an effect till June 1, 2024. Okay, so moving on. Um, limitations. Now, in a minute, we might go back to the last slide. Um, this, I think, is an example of what I discussed earlier when I'm talking about inconsistent provisions, okay? So that last one is saying landlords can prohibit smoking and vaping, but it doesn't say they have to prohibit, right? And um, that's effective um, this next month. This one essentially says that landlords in multifamily housing buildings essentially can't allow smoking and vaping beginning March 1, 2025, okay? Um, I'm not sure there's a good way to read these together. I suppose multifamily housing building is a little narrower than landlord. And so it's possible these could be read consistently, but it seems to go against at least my sense of the purpose of the law, because what, 
what the last slide was saying is that landlords can prohibit smoking and vaping, and that's effective starting um, next month. But then in a little less than two years, landlords would be prohibited from allowing that. Um, so I suspect that, and, and these sat in different parts of the law. Um, so I suspect that in an upcoming, you know, maybe in the next session, the apparent inconsistency of these two might be rectified one way or the other. I mean, maybe it's rectified by saying no smoking and vaping in apartments, period. Or maybe it says landlords can prohibit, but it seems like it would make more sense for it not to change on March 1, 2025. So we'll see. Um, next slide. Okay, we got a number of questions about how does this, how does all this kind of interplay with public and subsidized housing? And um, the short answer is it's a little messy, okay? So um, there are a lot of different public and subsidized housing programs. Uh, if, uh, if you've worked within one, you know about that one, but you may not know about all the other ones. Um, unfortunately, every time a new administration in Washington would want to kind of come up with a new subsidized housing program, it generally wouldn't get rid of an older one because there were contracts and people relying on how that was configured. So we got a lot of them out there. Um, probably the one that, probably the two that most landlords and landlord attorneys would find uh, some involvement might be with Section 8 vouchers. That's where tenants get a subsidy from a housing authority and they go out into the private market and, and look for a landlord who uh, wants to rent to them and operate within the confines of that program. Uh, and a lot of landlords do because the program is not heavily regulated, um, you know, um, um, and, and the landlord gets part of the rent from the housing authority as a subsidy. So it makes it more likely that the tenant's gonna be able to pay their rent as time goes on. So it's a nice program. Um, other landlords and landlord attorneys might uh, be involved with subsidized housing projects. Uh, these would be buildings that are under a different subsidy program. And in that, if the tenant leaves a unit there, they leave their subsidy behind. When a tenant has a Section 8 voucher, the, the subsidy tends to move around with them unless the tenant is violating some of the rules of the program. Okay. So with that being said, uh, I'm, now I still wanna stay on that slide for a moment. So public and subsidized housing owners are directed by HUD to establish admission standards that prohibit the admission of applicants. If any member of the household is currently engaging in the illegal use of a drug, or if there's cause to believe that a household member's illegal use or pattern of illegal use may interfere with health, safety, right, peaceful enjoyment of premises of other tenants. And I give you sites to a number of the different laws for the different programs there. So, um, so we now have essentially a, a lot of cannabis use that is not illegal in Minnesota, but we still have federal laws that say that a lot of, you know, pretty much anything in the cannabis category under federal law would be illegal use. Okay. So um, I, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna tell you about kind of the messiness here and then tell you what my thoughts are on how that may or not be um, kind of rectified. Okay. So, um, you know, yeah, so why don't, why don't we move on to the next slide and, and I'll kind of get to my thoughts on how this all works together in a few minutes. Okay, so the other side of kind of the equation here is in the eviction world. And most public and subsidized housing programs allow the landlord to terminate leases and subsidies and evict tenants for drug-related criminal activity or illegal use or a pattern of illegal drug use 
that interferes with the health, safety, right, peaceful enjoyment of the premises for other residents. Now, I've been doing this for a long time, and most of the eviction cases that I've seen in the public subsidized housing world related to drugs really focused on the first part of the sentence and not the second part of the sentence, um, because it was an easier case. Illegal drug, criminal activity, bam. It's a little tougher to show that the illegal drug use or pattern of illegal drug use interfered with the health, safety, right, peaceful enjoyment of the premises by other residents, okay? So I haven't seen a lot of litigation in that area, okay? And so, um, so, it, so again, we've got Minnesota laws saying that a lot of categories of cannabis possession and use are not crimes. And then we have federal criminal laws to say that they are. So let's move on to the next slide. So how's this gonna work out, okay? Well, the question really is going to be, are the courts going to evict tenants uh, who are engaging in legal use under Minnesota law, but criminal use under federal law? And there's been, there have been some decisions on this, nothing that went up to the appellate courts, but uh, a number of district court decisions. And this is from kind of the era of the laws from which we are changing. And so we had a category of laws in Minnesota, or we had a law in Minnesota that said that possession or use of a small amount of marijuana was a petty misdemeanor. And in Minnesota, a petty misdemeanor is an offense, but it's not a crime, okay? Um, because you can't go to jail for the petty misdemeanor, uh, you can you certainly have a fine. So small use of marijuana, um, was essentially um, like a traffic ticket, okay? But it was a crime under federal law. And there have been several court decisions at the district court level where the court said, we're not going to evict someone who's possessing a petty misdemeanor amount of marijuana um, because we're finding that it's not criminal use under state law. Now, those decisions did not go into kind of a preemption analysis. Now, I discussed those decisions in a section of my manual, uh, Residential Eviction Defense and Tenant Claims in Minnesota. And once you get a um, actual uh, electronic version of the slideshow, you can click on that link and uh, it would take you to there. You can also find that at a website that I have that's called povertylaw.homestead.com. So I think where this is going to go, and I don't, I don't have the answer for you right now, is an issue of preemption. Is the federal law, criminal laws saying that drugs are crimes, that's, that certain types of drugs are crimes, is that going to preempt application of like the, the law we have in the changed 504B171 that says that the landlord can't prohibit um, certain types of cannabis use on the property. And we've got public and subsidized housing federal laws that allow a landlord to evict for drug-related criminal activity. We have state law saying that certain types of uh, cannabis possession use are not crimes, and we have federal law that's saying it is. Um, you know, this is, we don't have enough time to go into kind of an exhaustive analysis of preemption. I have a section in my manual about that. Um, there was a case, a few, probably the prominent case in the public subsidized housing world was the Lee case, and um, that case involved whether a, um, a limitation on late fees in Minnesota by statute would apply to, I think, the Section 8 voucher program. And the court um, and the argument was that the statute was preempted uh, in the subsidized housing program, and the court said it wasn't. Um, so we'll have to see. I think there are decent arguments both ways um, that this may be a preemption issue. So unfortunately, I can't give you the answer on that. I think that, I think as I look at all this together, 
I think a landlord um, certainly is free to prohibit um, smoking and vaping, and that would be consistent with the federal law. Um, where you get into the potential preemption issue is if the landlord wants to um, say, you can't use any cannabis on the property, um, and because the federal law would allow the landlord to do that. It doesn't require that the landlord evict a tenant for cannabis use in the property. There, there are very few mandatory eviction causes in federal law. There is for certain types of meth um, activity. Um, so um, we'll just have to see. Now, one other note uh, is that in the, and, and this is just specific to public housing tenants, is that they, starting August 1, have a right to a court appointed attorney in an eviction action claiming breach of lease. And we'll talk about that uh, in another session, but the court system right now is having meetings and working on the logistics of doing that. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll get through these next few slides pretty quickly. I wanted to spend a bit of time on the public and subsidized housing thing because we've got a number of questions about that and it's complicated. Okay, so this is getting at an area that is not specific to landlord and tenant, but I think it's something that uh, is worth discussing. Can people use marijuana in public, walking down a sidewalk, in a park, things like that. And the law does not expressly permit or prohibit public use, okay? So Article 1, Section 9 says that um, where, a, and where a tenant can, or where an adult can use cannabis. Now, it's not an exclusive list. It says, you, these are locations where you can use it. And so you can see what they are. So they're essentially private residence, private property uh, with some qualifications on it, premises of establishment or event license to permit. Okay. So there's kind of the implication that if that's where you can use it, that maybe you can't use it in the public. But let's go through a couple more slides and, and we'll tr I'll try to answer that question for you. So let's go to the next slide. The only section that discusses public use is this one. And it essentially says that local units of government can establish ordinances with a petty mister of offense for someone who uses cannabis, and you can see the different list of cannabis uses, in public, as long as public doesn't include, and then these three categories again, private residence, private property with some qualifications, premises, establishment, or event, license to permit on-site consumption. Um, so this one, I think, kind of implies that you can do public use unless there's an ordinance, a local ordinance that limits your ability to do that. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So there was some, uh, so I was interviewed by Peter Callahan at MinPost. Uh, about several things about this. This is one of the things we discussed. And so he reached out to um, one of the authors, Senator Lindsey Pork, and, and she said that, you know, she thought that the law was going to allow smoking and vaping pretty much anywhere where smoking and vaping tobacco is under the Minnesota Clean Indoor, Indoor Air Act. Okay. Next slide, please. And so, but you can see there are a couple of people that were interviewed for that that said different things. So one person was saying she thought it was understood that public use would be allowed. And another person said, well, I thought it didn't allow public use. So where does that leave that? I think it leaves it, it's a little bit risky for people to, um, you know, uh, have, you know, use cannabis in public until they know what um, city attorneys and police chiefs and county attorneys in the jurisdiction where they are, are, are going to interpret this. So my conservative advice would be to someone not do it in public until there's some public pronouncement or some clarification in the law or public pronouncement by local officials that 
we're not prosecuting for this, or some clarification that's made in the law. Next slide, please. And the last change um, that I wanted to note is that marijuana was moved from schedule a schedule one drug to schedule three drug. Essentially, that means it's been kind of demoted from kind of the nasty category to in the category that has more in common with things that you would find at, at a pharmacy. Next slide. All right, we have come to the end of the slides. Um, so we have about half an hour, which is perfect. Um, what we were kind of hoping for, for some questions. I am going to go through some of the more specific questions that were pre-submitted. Um, if I skip your question and you pre-submitted one, it's uh, because we covered a lot of it during the session. So if you have other questions to clarify, feel free to put them in the Q&A. All right, so, um, so some of the questions that were more related to subsidized housing that weren't specifically covered, um, how does uh, this, well, all right, this isn't subsidized housing, but what's the impact on say student dorm housing? Well, I didn't see anything in the law that, um, kind of carved out student dorm housing as being different from anything else. Like um, for instance, Andrea noted that there was a provision on sober houses. And part of the reason for that is that there's another chapter of Minnesota laws that has created some regulation of sober houses in terms of people's rights and things like that. Um, but I didn't see anything in here that separately regulated uh, dorms. And in my view, dorms are a landlord-tenant relationship. And you look at the definition of 504B.001 uh, as to who's a tenant, who's a landlord, um, dorms um, fit that definition. Um, and Jamie had a, a, a question specifically about um, in public housing, can they restrict cannabis growth on the property as part of that federal um, you know, question. <laughs> yeah. So, um, again, I mean, I mean, that's one of the complicating things. There mm -hmm. isn't anything in federal law that requires a landlord to, um, requires a landlord to prohibit growing on, on the property. Um, the landlord has had the power to evict for drug-related criminal activity. But there wasn't anything that said the landlord had to evict for drug-related criminal activity. So now we have a Minnesota law that allows for growing, and but there are limitations on where you can do that. And so the way I'm, so I think that a landlord um, is going to need to follow, you know, I guess, I guess I should be a little careful what I say, because this is a pretty confusing area. Um, I don't see a conflict where the state is saying landlord you, or people get to grow. And then there's a federal law that says landlords can evict for drug-related criminal activity. There isn't anything in federal law that says that the landlord has to not let the tenant grow. So um, so I think the tenant can grow. Um, the tenant has to be careful about growing because as Andrea was mentioning earlier, there, you know, can't be accessible to the public, can't be in direct view of the public. So not on the balcony outside the apartment, inside the apartment in a area that's locked. Um, I think the tenant has the right to do that, but in public and subsidized housing, um, tenants are taking some risk that the landlord might try to evict for drug-related criminal activity as viewed under federal law. And, and then we'll have to see how the ju ju judiciary kind of deals with the fact that we've kind of got these parallel universes here. We got federal law and we got state law. 
So taking a risk, basically. But um, okay. Uh, well, the see. tenant takes mm -hmm. the tenant takes the risk. I yeah. mean, the, the, that's the what land, I Right. I mean, the landlord in a public or subsidized housing program could say, uh, "I'm going to follow the state law. I'm not going to evict people uh, who are who are." or acting legally within state law. Where, where we're gonna run into the problem is where the tenant wants to use under state law and the landlord wants to evict under federal law. And then we'll have to see what the courts do with it. Absolutely. All right, um, uh, several jumping around to kind of uh, the ability to limit smoking and growing. Um, there's just a couple of general questions. Um, someone. Could we define quick what a multifamily housing is? Um, um, well, while we're talking, I could do a quick search and see if there's a specific definition of it. I mean, if you take it just in yeah. its common usage, it would mean mm -hmm. some structure where you have more than one unit in a building, right? So that would be yeah. duplexes on up. Mm -hmm. uh, and but would not include rental of a of a single family home, um, yeah. and, and where that comes up is those two provisions that we were discussing, where it says, landlord, you can't limit um, use on the property other than smoking, vaping, starting next month, and then we have this other section saying essentially that multi-family buildings mm -hmm. you can't have smoking and vaping. Um, so that might be the distinction between the two. I, I really think this is a, a evidence of disconnection between two different parts of the law. Yeah, I'm think... not. Yeah. I'm not seeing a specific definition in mm -hmm. in the session law. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I yeah. agree with Larry. This is one area where there really wasn't a a solid connection between two two separate areas of law and their, mm -hmm. their advocates. And keep in mind, the, the, multi, the multifamily one doesn't have an effective date until March 1 of 2025. So I think something is going to get clarified before then to reconcile those two provisions. Um, and then, so kind of a accumulation of two different questions. Um, can a tenant get a reasonable accommodation to smoke cannabis in their unit? What are your okay. thoughts and opinions on that? Yep. Okay. And this gets at another difference between Minnesota law and um, federal law. So reasonable accommodation, most people think it's only an element of federal law because it was it it first kind of rears its head in the reasonable. And the, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, it applied to subsidized public housing. Then it's part of the um, Fair Housing Amendments in 1988. And essentially, for those of you that don't know what a reasonable accommodation is, a person with a disability has the right to request a reasonable accommodation in a number of different spheres of society. And one of those is with a landlord. And essentially, without getting too technical about it, it's it's asking a landlord to make a change that'll make it more um, likely that a tenant with a disability can maintain their independence and remain a tenant. So um, yeah, so an example might be that, um, um, I don't wanna get too far down the road of examples, but anyway, so that's what the concept is. Now, under federal law, if you are engaged in current illegal drug use, you don't qualify for a reasonable accommodation. But state law does not have that uh, distinction. So what state law has is, uh, and it's in the Minnesota Human Rights Act. I, I knew this question was coming up, so I, I did a little quick research on it. So Human Rights Act is 363A, and it's got a discussion of who's a qualified disabled person for the purposes of reasonable accommodation. And says a disability excludes any condition resulting from alcohol or drug abuse, which prevents a person from performing essential function of jobs. So that's kind of in the job category, or constitutes a direct threat to the property or safety of other persons. So that's the only limitation on the con on, on kind of the concept of where does drugs intersect 
with reasonable accommodation. And so the operative words there, in my view, is that we have drug abuse and that's posing a direct threat to property or safety of others. And so I think, um, and I'm not a reasonable accommodation expert, but as I read these, I think the tenant could ask for a reasonable accommodation under state law where they may not be able to ask it under federal law. Yeah, complicated. Also, thank you for the plug for, um, you know, pre-submitting your questions when you register for these things, because then we can scurry around and do a, a, a little more research and get a more thorough answer into some of these very complicated questions. Um, another kind of uh, combining of a couple of different questions here. Um, do uh, our landlords going to have to update leases to specifically limit uh, marijuana? Or um, can a general kind of no smoking cover things? Um, and does the tenant have to agree to any of those changes for them to take effect? Well, again, um, starting August 1, the only thing that the landlord could, um, could prohibit of the different types of uses that is legal is um, the smoking and the vaping. And so, you know, just looking at the language that's used there, um, it says, um, just going back and looking at it again. Okay, a landlord cannot prohibit legally possessing, okay, other than consumption by essentially vaping and smoking. So if the landlord wants to um, prohibit that, the, the, the safest thing would be to take the language right out of the statute. Um, um, and the language there is consumption by combustion or vaporization of the product and inhalation of smoke, aerosol, or vapor from the product. Um, if, if you want to be kind of, um, if, you, if you want to cover all the bases, I think adopting that language in the lease might be a little better than if you just said no smoking or vaping, um, does that leave open, for instance, aerosol use? So um, I think if a landlord wants to prohibit uh, that type of um, that type of use, the safest thing would be to adopt the language uh, from the law. Yep. All right. Um, let's see here. So then, onto a couple of uh, miscellaneous questions we had. Um, so uh, Jessica, I think, just had a really interesting note to put out um, their tenant that while looking for apartments in June and July, they've seen a number of restrictions on houseplants and potting soil, which may or may not be kind of related to this. Um, so it's not really a question, but an interesting comment on some of that and whether that's a, you know, a thing that can be restricted. Um, well, um, mm -hmm. landlords are- I've seen the potting soil oh. one before too. Mm -hmm. Now go ahead, Larry. Well, landlords are relatively free to have a lot of do's and don'ts. I mean, there, there are not a lot of laws that say what landlords can't have in their lease. Um, there are some, but they're not, they're not a ton. Uh, and so if, a, if, you know, I, I suspect, you know, so I got a nice grand piano in the back room there because I'm a professional jazz pianist, right? I suppose a landlord could say no grand pianos, right? And grand piano is not a protected class, right? And so there are a lot of things that can be prohibited. And I imagine that potting, slope, uh, potting soil is one of them. But now a tenant, you know, a, a, an adult, 21 years older, has the right to have plants, right? And so what this law does, at least in the cannabis area, is says landlord, my view is, as I look at all this, is a landlord cannot say to the tenant, you can't have the plants if the tenant follows kind of the qualifiers for what, what is legal mm -hmm. for plants. Yep. Um, and then just again, another combination of a uh, bunch of questions about, um, is there going to be any difference or impact from these in how a landlord or property manager would uh, 
deal with um, smoking complaints from neighbors. I don't what think they're really, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't see there being a huge change. The, the way the law stands right now, if a tenant has an issue with any kind of issue with a landlord um, or things like smoke in the building or things like that, they can treat it as a repair issue and give the landlord notice of the problem and give them 14 days to correct it. And then they're able to go to court, file a rent escrow quick rent escrow case and get a court order for the landlord to fix the issue. So that that remedy is still there. And I Larry might might have some comments in the in the realm of the nuisance provisions, but that that manner of dealing with the problem is definitely still available and it's very effective too. Yep. And what the what this law adds is the nuisance claim. Um, and so you know if I were, so if I were advising a tenant who didn't like something that another tenant was doing that was affecting that person's use and enjoyment of the property that was in violation of a lease and landlord wasn't um, enforcing the lease, I would probably go down the rent escrow route or if it were an emergency and emergency tenant remedies action because they move relatively quickly. Um, the nuisance provisions in here simply says that, you know, in that same scenario with, you know, for instance, you know, marijuana smoking or something, the tent, you know, another tenant could file this nuisance case. But, you know, what's what's the remedy that's going to be there? Would well, it probably be the same remedy you could get in the in the rent escrow action, um, but it's not going to move fast. I mean, it's it's going to be a conventional piece of civil litigation. And so, you know, at some point, maybe you you have to do a motion for you know preliminary injunction or restraining order or something like that. I think a red escrow uh, uh, would be a much more effective way to deal with that than than the nuisance provisions that are here. And things like smells from like plants growing and things are again the same thing. You know, having you know someone cooking fish you know, in the next apartment and that comes into your apartment is, you know, you go, you're going to handle that, you know, the same way that you would any sort of plant smell issues yep. as well. Yep. You, you have to give the landlord notice of the problem, give them a chance to fix it. And then if not, that's when you can take them to court. Yep. And there is also a, you know, understanding that living in a communal living situation, some of those things are just going to be a part of that community. So it's a, but ultimately it is up to the courts to decide what is that. Um, and then I wanted to just adjust quick. Nicole, uh, you had sent in a, a pre submitted question about rent escrow uh, results over the last five years in Crow Wing County. We do not have that. I don't know that anyone has those results. If you have them or you know how to get them, please let us know. We'd, be interested to hear about them, but um, we're not going to be able to help you out there. Sorry. Okay. Um, so let's get on to, we've got uh, about 20 minutes left, which is great. So let me get into the questions that were submitted here during the session. Um, so, let, um, all right. So anonymous, let's we'll start at the top and work our way down. Um, so, Anonymous is asking, if there's a crime-free addendum on the lease, does that mean it goes by federal law? Well, um, it's, a, it's the same thing, uh, same kind of mushy answer I've been giving you all day, <laughs> is that we're going to have to see where the courts go with that. Um, uh, something we'll be discussing in, in, another, uh, in another seminar is a change to Minnesota law related to uh, crime-free ordinances. And so, um, and, and that's, but that doesn't, that law doesn't go into effect until January. Um, again, it's, you know, tenants are, tenants that have, you know, crime-free lease addendums are gonna have to make kind of a risk assessment of, um, will my landlord um, try to evict me 
for doing something that is not criminal behavior under state law, but is potentially criminal behavior under federal law. Um, in this area of when cities are saying to landlords, you, we might pull your rental license if you allow certain types of criminal activity to happen in your property. Um, uh, I'm not a big fan of those laws because they kind of put landlords kind of, they're stuck in between cities and tenants as to what they ought to be doing. Um, if a city is trying to enforce that provision against a landlord, uh, at some point, um, you know, we may see some litigation on, in these various different scenarios where the courts are going to have to decide uh, if something is uh, not a crime under state law, but is potentially a crime under federal law, what's the answer? Uh, I can't give you the answer because we don't have any decisions specifically on that yet. Yep. All right, the next one uh, we just talked about with smoke issues. Uh, Alyssa is asking an HOA question, which we honestly, we don't do a lot with HOAs. They are a weird stepchild of tenancies and uh, ownership. Um, but the question is, can a, a condo homeowner association ban cannabis, even if it doesn't ban cigarette smoking? So can a property owner, I'm going to broaden this out a little bit more, can a property owner ban one and not the other? Well, um, That, you know, that that's an interesting question because that kind of gets to that. Yeah, and I, I my gut reaction is no. Um, when, you know, adults have, yeah. adults have the right to do certain things now that they didn't have the right to do before. And, you know, maybe you want to talk about that slide that you had earlier where it said, uh, where it talked about prohibit prohibition from the owner of the property that might have been like slide 14 or something yeah i'm thinking a little bit early there you go just from the point of view of say the minnesota indoor air act they're both the same and it, it doesn't matter they the minnesota clean indoor air act prohibits smoking really anything um so in that context it's really not going to matter they're going to be treated as as more or less the same and and you won't if you ban one you have to ban the other um in in public places and and things like that um i'm i'm inclined i'm kind of agreeing with larry that i i don't see that they could that you could really separate the two and my thinking on that is that when when you have a condo, you do own your space. Now you are in a relationship through an association with other condo owners, but you are the owner of your condo. And so I think that the condo association could potentially, if it is the owner of the common spaces, could say, okay, in the common spaces, mm -hmm. you can't you can't have edibles, for instance. Um, but I think within each person's condo, they would have yeah. that ability to have um, you know edibles and to um, smoke marijuana. Yeah. All right. Um, this one, um, they were. Anonymous is wondering if landlords uh, need to, if they have a designated smoking area, do they need to have a special smoking area for uh, tobacco versus cannabis on their property? Hmm. But I, I think, again, uh, kind of going, going to what Larry was saying, that, that there are there are some contradictions in this statute mm -hmm. because it, the intention of the legislatures, it sounds like the legislators was to have basically marijuana treated just like cigarettes and that wherever cigarettes could be consumed, then marijuana could be consumed, mm -hmm. which would be outside. But at the same time that 
um, there is a, a concern that the usage um, be on one's own property or um, with the permission of the owner of the property. I, I think practically, I'm assuming we're talking about outside smoking areas. Um, I don't, I don't think you would need to have two separate ones. It, it may, from a logistical and a record keeping point of view, it might make sense, but I, I think you would be more or less treating them the same. Yeah, it's, I, I wonder if it's stemming from this, you know, actually on the slide that we're still on is um, that you're allowed to use them on areas not generally accessible to the public. And so yeah. depending on where your cigarette smoking area is, maybe that is a problem. Yeah. So. And, and the only reason to have some separation would be if you're concerned about the nuisance lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And so in theory, the cigarette smoker doesn't like the marijuana smoker in the same space <laughs> and, 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 but then, you know, and, and the bar is kind of low on those nuisance cases, but the remedy is also pretty minimal. So, you know, if you're concerned about that, um, maybe having some sort of separation there, but um, again, I'm, I'm, unless I'm totally misreading things, I really don't think the nuisance sections of this law are really going to amount to much. Yeah. Well, that leads us really well into our next question, Larry. Thank you. You've been really sending me some excellent transitions today. <laughs> um, <laughs> what I do. <laughs> so um, this question is wondering, uh, could a landlord or government unit use those nuisance sections to kind of bootstrap uh, a violation of crime-free ordinance or a nuisance ordinance already on the books that for landlord tenants? Hmm, having a little trouble following that. Yeah, I'm not certain that I entirely understand what they mean by uh, crime-free ordinances, or if the, maybe it's, um, if there's a crime-free ordinance that's already in place, like in a lease or something like that, that just prohibits. Okay, well, you know, I'm, I mean, there are a lot of crime-free ordinances out there, uh, and what what this does is, is kind of muddies the water a little bit, right? I mean, when cannabis use was a crime under state and federal law, it would be a violation of one of those ordinances, right? And what's now muddied the water is that there are a lot of uses now that aren't crimes under state law, but potentially crimes under federal law. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of kind of not answering the question, but to some extent, I have to give you the same answer I've been given as uh, giving so far is until we get some guidance from the courts on how they're going to navigate the, the difference here. Um, it, it's a hard one to answer. And, and I do I do feel for landlords that have, I mean, I've been a landlord myself. So if you think all of us at home line hate landlords, we don't hate landlords. We like good landlords. Right. And um, but I feel for landlords that are kind of in this spot where a city might be saying, you know, we want you want all of our apartment buildings to have no elements of crime of any level, right? And then you have tenants that you like that you want to continue to rent to them. And but now the city is maybe saying that this type of use of the property by this tenant is putting your license at risk. Um, how that's going to shake out. I mean, hopefully uh, we'll see cities kind of see the general intent of this law and, and try to operate how they're operate under these ordinances in a way that's consistent with what clearly the Minnesota legislature wanted to happen. But if we have cities that don't, ultimately the courts are going to have to decide is a landlord going to lose a rental license for not evicting a tenant for something that's legal under state law and potentially criminal under federal law. Yep. Hopefully it doesn't get to that, uh, but you know that that's, that's, that's a potential thing down the road. 
All right, I am going to scoot us along because we've got about 10 minutes left and still have about 13 questions. Um, Andrea, you and I spoke about this one really briefly. Um, are there any parts of the bill that protect people against race-based discrimination, specifically in this cannabis bill? Um, I took a look and I did not see anything in this bill particularly that prohibits against race-based discrimination. Um, however, there are protections against discrimination in the Fair Housing Act, Minnesota Human Rights Act. So even though it's not mentioned in this, this session law specifically, those protections are still there. So, so the way I see these working together is that if, if a landlord was saying to the white tenants, use what you want, and saying to people in a protected class, you don't get to use it, now they're making decisions based on race. Okay. Um, so I'm going to skip this next one because uh, we had a couple of different questions about that same thing, and I want to cover them all at once. Um, Andrea, Janana, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it. Maybe it's Yanana. Sorry. Um, just want to know quick about the sober housing rules. Sure. Um, I'm just going to go back to that slide real quick for you. Um, that way you can take a look at it uh, and we can move on quick. Yeah, the, the sober housing. Um, Larry was talking about the covenant between landlord and tenant and how that's going to be, that has been rather um, amended to an to allow for the possession of cannabis. Um, however, um, and in the in the new covenant between landlord and tenant, uh, a landlord cannot prohibit the legal possession of, of cannabis. However, in sober homes, it is possible if a sober housing program is a program for people with substance use disorders, they may prohibit people in the program from the possession and use of cannabis flower products, uh, lower potency hemp edibles and hemp derived consumer products. So that is an exception to the rewritten covenant between landlord and tenant. Perfect, thank you. All right, um, and the provision about multifamily housing buildings, um, are we talking in a person's unit or in the common area? So I think that's a really good distinction for to clarify is where do these restrictions or allowances apply to in a rental, pure rental? We're not talking condo buildings here now, we're talking just pure rental. Yeah, and again, that's the pro the only reference to multifamily buildings is in the provision that goes into effect in uh, 2025. And um, as I read that one, it meant that, um, that a smoking and vaping was not allowed, whether a landlord wanted it or not, in units as well as the rest of the building. That's how I read that one. Uh, again, I think uh, we're gonna see some clarification of the difference between the change in 504B171 that starts next month and that one, you know, I. I did, I did raise it, so it's my fault, but um, I think we should not obsess over that because we got a year and three-fourths to figure out if that's even going to be around. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, looks like we got a repeat question. Um, do we know if uh how this has played out in other states with subsidized housing and the legalization of marijuana and drug-based evictions uh, a little bit there has been some litigation around the country on the issue of what happens when local laws are different than federal laws in the public and subsidized housing world and it's really kind of a mixed bag i mean you have some jurisdictions and there's actually a lot of language in, um, in, in the comments to regulations about how federal subsidized public housing programs have to kind of interact with localities in terms of states. So for instance, they use local eviction processes that there's no federal eviction process. Uh, and so some jurisdictions have said, 
Um, the federal laws and state laws can coexist, and we're going to let those state laws do what they do. And the others have said when they bump into each other, uh, we're going to we're going to say the federal trumps the state. So I, I don't think we can get a lot of um, get a great answer from what's happened in other states. All right. Um, does a shelter or transitional housing qualify as multifamily housing? That's a really good question, and I'm trying to come up with a, a response on that right now. <laughs> so I'll I keep looking. Do if those you folks have, if you have something, tenants. Larry? Well, yeah. So keep in mind, um, again, my fault. Uh, the whole <laughs> multi-family thing doesn't go into effect until 2025, if it even does. Okay. So I think the 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 better question is: Is everything that we're discussing apply to shelters? Okay. Mm -hmm. And in my view. It does. Okay. When you look at the definition of what is a tenant, what's a landlord uh, in 504B001, someone who's in a shelter um, meets those parameters. Um, and and there also, when you look at the laws that regulate motels and hotels, there is a presumption that if someone has some place to live elsewhere, they're considered a hotel guest. But if they don't have some place to live elsewhere, they're not considered a hotel guest, which defaults you over to tenant. So I think the short answer is that this stuff is going to apply to any place that is um, the things that we've talked about under 504B171 are going to apply to places that are renting a space to somebody else. And a shelter resident, even if that person isn't paying, someone is paying for that person to reside in the space that's owned by yeah. somebody else. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm with Larry on this. Um, generally, transitional housing programs are in apartments, in apartment buildings, and they have an apartment setup. So I could see that those would be those would be uh, considered multifamily housing. Um, and I I I'm not finding a definite answer on the shelter question, but again, I'm doing that as we speak um so again looking at the is the person either paying to live there exchanging services to live there they have someone paying for them to live in a shelter to to cover their costs so i think that you can you can consider those as tenants and the shelter is multifamily housing yeah. all right um we are just about at time so i want to um, we have a, just a couple more questions left. So if you are able to stay on for a couple of extra minutes, um, would you be able to finish up the questions that we've got here, Larry and Andrea? Okay, awesome. Um, I want to make sure quick for those of you who do have to go, uh, who are in the audience here, I'm sorry for the quick scrolling, but um, here's our upcoming webinars on the rest of the laws. Larry made some references to um, our upcoming ones. The next one is next uh, August 16th, and that's going to be about changes to fee disclosures, pet decline, devocalization, move in and move out exceptions, and restrictions on early lease renewals. So we will see you then if you have to leave. Otherwise, if you can stay on for a couple of minutes, we will continue going through these. Um, I want to then get too quick. There's these two here that say about just outright bans of cannabis. Um, can a landlord or property owners outright ban um, if they put that um, in their leases that there can be no cannabis products whatsoever on the property. No. No, they could ban the use. They have control of the use, particularly when it comes to smoking, but they can't ban possession out and out having it on the property. And, and so the only use that they can ban are the smoking and the vaping. So for instance, if someone is using cannabis and they're baking something or they're having it uh, in an edible or something like that, um, can't ban that either. I put in the chat a link to a section in my manual that discusses the interrelationship between shelters and landlord tenant law. Yeah, I, all right, perfect. Thank you for that. All right.
And then uh, Meg is wondering, um, does this legislation have any impact on how landlords can screen potential tenants? So could they reject a rental application based on a recent misdemeanor from like 2022 for marijuana possession? There, there is a provision in the legislation for the automatic expungement of cannabis related offenses, certain cannabis related offenses. So, and this takes effect in August 1st. So this, this may, this question may resolve itself. Um, there is some infrastructure that has to be put into place. So I'm, I'm not sure whether this will be ready to go and, and taking, a, um, actually the records will be expunged as of August 1st, but that, that is something that was considered in the legislation. Um, so there is that um, in the picture. When it comes to recent misdemeanors, there are, say for Minneapolis, that does have some um, guidelines when, when screening tenants uh, using a, a specific, a specific um, assessment of their situation that could possibly screen those out um screen those out from consideration yeah you know it's certainly possible that landlords might be able to screen for um things related to uh consumption in the past uh the only prohibitions i saw in the law were related to participation in in the in the kind of registry programs and things like that mm -hmm. and landlords have a lot of freedom to have both smart and dumb limitations on to whom they're going to rent. Um, and so, for instance, um, let's say you don't want to rent to me because I'm a jazz pianist. That's legal. Might be smart, might be dumb, hard to say. Um, <laughs> so there, are, even though I don't, there aren't any limitations on me playing the piano. Um, in society. So it may be that landlords can screen out. I mean, there's certain things landlords can't screen, but those are very specific laws that prohibit discrimination and things like that. Yeah, and this so, ties back to the other question about race-based discrimination too. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, Not to cut you off, Larry. Oh, cutting me off is always a useful thing. I'd rent to you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Kimberly is wondering, um, this is kind of going back to the, um, a tenant, you know, one tenant complains about a different tenant. Um, and what they're asking is who do you side with? And that, that's a very, um, loaded question, frankly, about, you know, it's not a, it's not a picking sides thing. It's making sure that, uh, things are in the leases are enforced and if there's some health issues such as asthma and things like that like those same smoking issues that are already extant in say tobacco use are you know those remedies are still in place for the uh, cannabis use plus there's this extra nuisance option that may or may not be of use to somebody in that situation yeah that's a tough call for the landlord they have yep. They have to balance the health and safety of their tenants with the right to have to use cannabis in the building. So, um, but again, it's something that can be addressed in a rent escrow case, um, just like mm -hmm. repairs that need to be made and and possibly treated as a nuisance. Yeah, and you know, as long as a, a tenant is a, you know just like any other citizen or non-citizen any other person here in the US if they've got a you know they can go and file a lawsuit it's whether that is a successful lawsuit or not is entirely up to the courts so whether it's a successful rent escrow for you know these things is the, the courts have to decide just like so many things we've been talking about today the courts kind of have the you know the say of like how these are going to be enforced so um, and then these materials are going to be available in a couple of days as soon as you can actually get all of it loaded. Um, I know Larry was going to add one more slide in. Uh, we will get those posted to the website, um, that same webinar website. I'll post that link again here quick. Um, but yeah, it should be just a couple of days before that is 
here. Do you two have anything else that you want to make sure that is covered or clear uh, before we I let you sign off? Awesome. Thank you so much then you two for coming and going and diving into these exceedingly gray areas of the law. Um, hopefully we've been able to provide a little bit more clarity. Um, but, you know, like Liz Lair was saying, like there's just there's a lot of unknowns as to how these are going to be enforced. So stay tuned. Um, as we know more, we will share more. Uh, I'm sure we'll have another webinar on this in the future, almost certainly. So thank you all for joining us and have a lovely rest of your day. Uh, and we hope to see you next month at our next webinar. Take care all. Bye bye.